Well, because I have so much to cover, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time editing my uh, dialogue here. The year I did this was 2012, so it's been quite a while, and I'll be going from memory. Paul Claus of Ultima Thule Lodge was going to be flying the Iditarod this year, as he has done for, I believe he had done the Iditarod for like 27 years up to this point, um, never missed a year. His daughter, Ellie, had actually competed in the Iditarod one year, and um, I think she was the youngest person to compete. This particular year, I went up, and Paul only had one paying client. Her name was Lorelai, and she was the radio announcer from Nome, and the contract with Paul was to fly from uh, Palmer to Unicleet. And then from Unicleet, I believe she was going to get on a plane and fly on to Nome for the completion of the race. So we only went as far as Unicleet this year. Paul asked me if I wanted to continue on. And at Unicleet, I really felt like I had kind of experienced everything I'd wanted to. Looking back, I regret not going to Nome and seeing the finish line. There were a few things that probably changed my plans as far as doing the complete trip. Um, one, fuel was super expensive. It was $10 a gallon in most places. And the other thing was um, I just really wasn't having the fun that I thought I was going to have. When Paul invited me up, the premise was that I would come up and basically tag along. It wouldn't really cost me anything other than I'd have to pay for my own fuel. He was going to supply me with a Super Cub, one of his Super Cubs, and I was going to get to basically um, see what the Iditarod was all about. The, the information I had was basically um, hearsay from other people that had done the trip with him in the past. And they were usually larger groups. And I can see where if it was a larger group, it would probably be a lot more fun. But each village that we came to, you would wait for the mushers to catch up. So you would spend anywhere from a day to two days in a village. And then you'd be on again because I didn't really know anybody and I wasn't up on who was in the race and what their stats were or any of that it really became kind of uneventful over time and i was just ready for it to be over by the end i think i spent somewhere around seven days we started out the trip from palmer and followed all the way to unicleet so backing up a little bit when i got to anchorage paul offered me his cub, BK, known as BK, and I took it out and played around a little bit with it, and I was telling my friend Hank, who bought Got Rocks from me, and he said, well, why don't you just take Got Rocks? And when he said that, it was like, really? And he's like, sure. He goes, I don't have any insurance on it, so if you wreck it, it's going to cost you whatever it costs you, but you're welcome to use it. So with that, I decided to go ahead and take Got Rocks. And so I hopped in the airplane and went out to his cabin with him for a few days, I believe. And that's when I shot this footage here. I was playing around one afternoon when it was really nice out. For those of you who don't know about Got Rocks, I built this airplane in 2008. And it's uh, a 180 horse Super Cub. I built it really light. At the time when I finished it, it weighed 1,053 on 35 inch bush wheels with the 180 horse and a 90 inch metal prop. Hank had since changed a few things. He went to a Cato prop, so it lost weight. And I'm sitting on some brand new carbon fiber skis here, which I believe weighed 19 pounds each. So the total weight of the airplane set up the way it was here was probably around a thousand pounds. The airplane was just an amazing performer. He also added double slotted flaps. 
And I'm trying to think if there's anything else he did to it. I think that was about it. So double slotted flaps, had the carbon fiber skis, 86 inch Kato prop. And it was just super fun to fly. Since I'm doing a video about the Iditarod, I figured I'd give you some statistics for it. This year, there's 66 mushers starting the race at Anchorage on March 4th. The winner will receive a prize of $50,400 and a new truck. The total purse is $550,000 to be shared between 30 of the first finishers. The Iditarod race has been held for 40 years. It's estimated that the Iditarod Trail has been used for 100 years by Alaskans. The 2012 Iditarod winner is Dallas Seavey. His age is 25. He's the youngest ever to win the Iditarod. And his time was 9 days, 4 hours, and 29 minutes, which equates to 7.27 miles per hour for his sled dog team. His father and grandfather also ran it this year. There's a total of 24 checkpoints along the way, and the longest distance between checkpoints is 85 miles. That's between Caltag and Uniclete. There's going to be 52 veterans watching over the health of the dogs, and the maximum allowable number of dogs for each team is 16. There's an estimated 1,500 volunteers between Anchorage and Nome. And the second place winner for this year, 2012, was Ali Zirkel from Two Rivers, Alaska. It's the northern route. This route is ran every other year. They alternate between southern and northern routes. And there's approximately 975 miles in this route. They cross the Alaska Range. It's about 5.30 in the evening, Monday, I believe it's March 5th, and we're at Nikolai, Alaska. We're waiting for the first dog mushers to get here. They probably won't be in until later this evening or possibly in the morning. We uh, came from Palmer, left Palmer about 8 a.m. this morning, flew through Rainy Pass and then on to Nikolai. Uh, pretty much encountered weather from about Rainy Pass on. Arrived Nikolai in snowing conditions with maybe better than a mile visibility. Paul Claus and myself. Uh, flight of two Super Cubs. And now we're just uh, waiting in the school where it's warm. So I'll see if I can get some dog mushing interviews later on today. I think it snowed at least, it looks like since we arrived, it snowed at least five inches. And it's uh, not real great flying conditions. But uh, we're just waiting anyway, so it doesn't matter much. It's kind of hard to see how much snow is already built up on the wings but there's a fair amount of snow already. I'm gonna be honest with you, when Paul and I set off from Palmer, I didn't really do any flight planning and it was a mistake on my part to take off without doing any flight planning. At one point, when we were flying through the pass to get to Nikolai, the visibility was extremely low I basically had Paul's wing in sight and that was about all I had in sight we were flying in pretty much almost whiteout conditions flying close to the ground and I was following him in hopes that he knew where he was going and what he was doing and I felt pretty uncomfortable at that point because I didn't do any of my own flight planning and I was relying on his navigation at that point. I did have a GPS 
but we didn't have any way of communicating because both of our cubs didn't have electrical systems. I think we had handheld radios, but we had them off most of the time. It was uh, a little bit of a tense uh, few hours, but managed to make it there and got landed. I know when Paul landed, I followed him in and because I was so close to him, I didn't feel like I could really land. And so I came back around to land and Paul said that he couldn't even see me. That's how bad the visibility was because Paul had been so involved in the Iditarod over the years, either hauling passengers or even his own daughter, um, Ellie having her own dog team. And I think at one time they had over a hundred dogs out at the lodge that they were building their team from. It takes a huge amount of effort to create a dog team. Paul knew everybody at these different checkpoints. So he was constantly in conversation with people that were almost like family to him over the years, created a network of other people to uh, share the experience with. At each checkpoint, the veterinarians look over the dogs really well and make a determination whether those dogs can continue on. If you lose dogs, basically your team's gonna get smaller as you go. So it's better to keep the dogs healthy. The mushers take care of the dogs first. Whenever they get to a checkpoint, the dogs get fed, bedding gets put down, and the dogs are first, and then the mushers take care of themselves second. We spent one night in Nikolai. We camped out in the gymnasium in the school, and then the next day we watched as the mushers came in. The weather was somewhat improved, so it was a little bit of a relief to see that maybe we'd be able to take off with some better visibility. I have a lot of video of the dogs because this is really a dog race. It's about human endurance for sure, but it's about strategy and keeping your dogs healthy and happy. And I believe that these mushers really do an excellent job of taking care of their dogs. Lorelei wanted to get on the trail and actually see some of the mushers come by and do a live interview along the trail. So about mid afternoon, we hopped in the Cubs and headed for Takatna. I'm going to backtrack a little bit here and talk about how Paul and I spent uh, the better part of a day putting our gear together to actually make this trek. We wanted to have everything that we would need to both um, make the trip, but also in an emergency situation survive. So we spent um, several, probably three or four hours going through gear. So I'll just list off the gear that we had. We had uh, a sport cat heater for each airplane and an engine cover. We didn't take wing covers. Paul said that it was gonna be so cold that you wouldn't need wing covers, that the snow's not gonna stick to the wings. So no wing covers, but we each had sleeping bags. Paul had an Arctic oven tent, which is a double walled tent and a small stainless steel wood stove. And I packed most of that in my airplane because he had Lorelei as a passenger. So I was kind of the pack mule. I was using every inch of space in the Super Cub. I had the belly pod full and I had the cabin area full, and then I had the area above the um, where the turtle deck normally is full of gear. From the start? <laughs> I got the exact inch one at minus to one tank, so I have an angel fun at minus. Good. 400 miles. But it was two tanks, you know? Yeah. But that's the way to go. Yeah. That's like yeah, the new, uh, it's like two small, small, same thing. That's, oh, that's, no, that's that new E-Tech. That E-Tech's two strokes, the new one they made. I get 20 miles to the gallon, he gets 18. So well, that is to be there any second. Yeah, we're coming along good, isn't he? Mm. Right? All right. We'll see I you guess you're through. going to beat us. <laughs> He's a great guy. Have you done interviews with him? Uh -huh. He's such a friendly guy. Yeah.
Anyway, back to the gear discussion about what we're taking along with us. At one point, I asked him if I needed a tent, and he said, yeah, go ahead and take this uh, North Face tent. I was going to stick it in my belly pod, and then he was like, well, you don't really need a tent. So then I pulled it out of my belly pod, and then he said, well, go ahead and stick it in just in case. I had the North Face, and then he had the Arctic Oven. He also had me take two sleeping bags. Um, Both of them, I believe, were either a minus 15 degree or a zero degree bag. And so I had two sleeping bags that I could stick one inside the other. We needed propane for the Sport Cat heaters to keep our engines warm at night. And I think Paul figured we needed one bottle per night. Whatever it was that we calculated, we actually ran short. And by the time we got to Uniclete, we realized that we weren't going to have enough propane to um, keep our engines warm there or continue on. And so in Uniclete, we had to buy the small propane bottles, and they were $12 each. We ended up spending two nights at Takatna. The second day, I think Paul realized I might be getting a little bored, and so he suggested that we put our skis on and skin up this little hill behind the town and then ski back down to the town. Paul flies in his ski boots. My ski boots were brand new. I had just bought them at REI before I had set off on this trip with brand new skis. And so my boots were fitted at REI, but they were really too tight for me to fly in. So I was wearing some bunny boots that Paul had loaned me, which worked out really well. But back to our ski adventure. So we skinned up this little hill behind the town. And by the time I got to the top, my toes were numb. I don't think it had taken more than maybe an hour and a half for my feet to go from being warm to numb. And I told Paul about it. And I was pretty concerned because it was probably in the minus 15 to minus 20 degree range. And he just suggested unbuckling the buckles to get my circulation going and so I did that and we skied back down to the town and I got back to the warming area and I took my boots off and my feet were basically white from kind of the ball of my foot forward it took at least a few hours to get the blood flowing back into my toes and to where I could feel them again and I decided that using my ski boots at that point was pretty much worthless. They call themselves the Iditarod Air Force and they carry a lot of the supplies. It's all volunteer. They volunteer their time, their airplane, and I believe all the fuel that they use. Each team is required to take three mandatory rest breaks. One 24-hour layover to be taken at any checkpoint one eight-hour layover taken at any checkpoint on the Yukon River, and an eight-hour stop at White Mountain. The rest is at their discretion. At this point in the Iditarod, it has gotten pretty cold. I can't remember exactly how cold it was here at Cripple, but I think it was around minus, somewhere in the minus 15 to 20 degree range. I didn't have all my clothes on yet, all my layers but I was getting close and when you're just standing around and not much is happening it feels a lot colder I had experienced this kind of cold before because I lived in Alaska for a couple years in my 20s I think back then the coldest I ever saw was minus 30 when me and my wife took a trip to Fairbanks during the winter well my hands like to froze to death putting my pants on I know it's cold out yeah you Uh-huh. 
definitely colder here. Yeah, it's a lot colder. Yeah, because I pulled my gloves off at the other place and my hands were always fine. I mean, it's probably 10 to 15 degrees colder. Yeah. I didn't even think to look on my LOT gauge. In fact, I'm thinking about putting another jacket on. I haven't done that since I've been out. I've had Up to this point, we had not had to get a tent out. Each night, we had some place to throw our sleeping bag, and it was usually in a gymnasium or someplace warm. But coming up, we end up on the Yukon River. It's frozen over. It runs in the front of the town of Ruby, and I think we get there pretty late in the evening, and the town is up the hill quite a ways and Paul says that we're going to be camping out this night. I get the Arctic oven out of my airplane and Paul and I start to set up the tent. We then get the wood stove out of my airplane and we get the wood stove set up and we get a fire going in it and I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be nice. And about the time I'm thinking this is going to be nice, Paul says, you need to pull out your tent and start getting it set up. It's getting dark. And uh, he was right. I mean, it was getting dark pretty fast. And I looked at him and I thought he was joking. I said, you got to be joking. It's like minus 40 degrees out. And he's like, no. He goes, there's not room in this tent for all of us. And I'm like, it's a four man tent, isn't it? And he's like, well, with the wood stove, it just doesn't really leave any area for three people. And um, he says, you'll be fine. He goes, you got two sleeping bags. And he goes, I'll boil a Nalogen bottle full of water and that'll keep you warm throughout the night and I'm thinking I'm gonna die tonight Fortunately, I actually stayed pretty warm with the two sleeping bags and the boiled Nalogen bottle in the morning. I was still alive The video doesn't do it justice, but we were treated to some pretty spectacular northern lights also So we left Ruby just for the afternoon and we went to the hot springs when we landed at the hot springs, there were five super cubs there. They had spent the night and this picture I actually pulled off the internet. They had made their own tents and were making their way along the Iditarod trail. All of them were on wheel skis and we were there when they tried to leave and not one single one of them could leave under their own power. They were rocking their airplanes with the engine power, lifting the tail and putting it down. Finally, Paul said, let me give you a push. And so we pushed each one of them one by one and got them going. I don't know what the last guy would have done if we hadn't been there because they were all stuck. I think at this point, there was a, a fairly close race between the top three or four mushers. Dallas CV and Ali Zirkel were probably favorites to win it. Here's Dallas coming into the town of Caltag. Here's Paul and Lorelei coming in to land at Caltag. They left and went and landed along the trail to get some interviews with some mushers so that she could broadcast live over the Gnome radio. Unfortunately, in the nine years since I took all this video, I lost the tape between Caltag and Uniclete, so I don't have any of that footage. There really wasn't much more interesting 
to actually uh, show anyway. Coming over, they were going plenty fast. John, I'm telling you that dog chewed up her harness. First of all, when I left net left in the lotto, I was pretty tired. So I uh, got these guys going, made sure they were in their rhythm. Put my alarm clock in my hat. Hey, hey, guys. Took about a 30 minute nap. That felt great. Woke up, they were still doing the same speed. But then I got the harness out, did my. Uh, I do have kind of an interesting story though. I ran into Jim and Ferno Tweedo when I was going out to check on the catholic heaters to make sure that they were still keeping the engines warm early in the morning. And uh, as I was driving down the road, I passed this woman and she looked familiar. And she was running. And then I passed another guy. And he was not running quite as fast. And I, I thought he looked familiar too. And so I went to the airport and I checked on the catalytic heaters. And on my way back, they were going the opposite direction. And I pulled over and I rolled down my window. And I said, I know you. And uh, he says, you do? And I said, yeah, you're Jim Tito from Flying Wild Alaska. And he goes, yep. And I said, well... I just want to shake your hand and you know it's minus 40 degrees out and he just wants to run but anyway he reached in shook my hand and I said um, I enjoy your show and uh, my name is Greg Miller and I made the videos Big Rocks Long Props and uh, just wanted to introduce myself say hi and he says well that's really interesting he goes you're actually the guy that convinced me that I could actually use water to land on gravel bars so Thank you. Even though we're headed for Palmer today, Paul takes the opportunity to show me what the Super Cub can do on skis. And then we actually land a few places going back. Some of them are just spectacular out of this world. In fact, Paul says that there's a good chance that nobody's ever landed at them before. Once we shut down here, it's just so quiet, so peaceful. There's just nothing like it. It's almost like we're in another realm.
I think this is the second spot we landed and Paul had a idea of doing a flyby for me and being the showman that he is he gave me a really nice high speed low pass and then came up and landed right next to me We made it back to Palmer that day, and the next day, Paul asked me to fly 7-9er Alpha out to the lodge. He said it would help him in getting the airplanes out there early for the season, so I obliged. I took one of his guides with me, Bill Gerald, and um, spent the night, and I think Paul came the next day with the 185 and picked me up, and then it was time for me to head home. Even though this Iditarod trip wasn't exactly what I was expecting, in fact it was pretty far from what I was expecting, I experienced things that most people will never experience. And those experiences I wouldn't trade for anything. And I want to thank Paul for inviting me along. If you enjoyed what you watched here, please subscribe and hit the like button.